<laughs> Rowan, right. We met, when did we meet? A couple of years time, you crashed into the gallery. Just before lockdown. And um, I've always wanted to speak to you again, and you disappeared. I know I disappeared. <laughs> well, lockdown not literally, too. not literally. No, not literally, but you know, I'm back now. <laughs> and we're no, I was, I was absolutely delighted to see you on this panel, um, because I absolutely love your work. I love your work, I love your work, I love what you do. <laughs> I do love your work, um, always have done. Um, I first saw your work at Hastings, Hastings Open. Yep. Um, it was nothing to do with taxidermy or anything. It was just you with a sort of a, a twig crown or a head. It was taxidermy there too. too. It was a bit of both. There was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, I yeah. mean, the taxidermy was huge and the painting was... No, like, no, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the picture, the photo. Is it a painting or a photo? No, it's a photograph. Yeah, a photograph. That's what I was drawn to. No, I'm glad. I like yeah, that. No, yeah, no, I thought it was absolutely stunning. Um, but tell us about how you ended up working with animals. Um, taxidermy. Taxidermy, taxidermy, yeah. So I, I, I did taxidermy for about six years. It was like what you were saying about you do something for quite a long time. So I did the same thing for about six years and I've changed it very much. Well, there's elements that are the same, but I, I've changed. But I did a lot of work with taxidermy for about six or seven years. Um, I, went, I went to Aberdeen and I studied there. And I lived in a city and I've always lived in the countryside as a child, but I always took it for granted. I hated it. I wanted to live in the big smoke. And when I moved back after I did my BA, I did a master's in Dundee. So I lived in Fife in the countryside with my parents. And it was going back into that environment. I became so aware of the kind of negative impact that we have on the environment because I would find dead animals all the time. And I mean, in Hastings as well. It's really bad for in Hastings, actually, but where I lived, there was dead animals everywhere, and it made me start to think a lot about the effect that we have on the environment, because I didn't think about it when I lived in a city, and it kind of made me want to make work about that. And at the time, this was about 2010, I think there was a lot of conversations that were starting to happen about our effect on the environment and what we were doing. It, in global warming as well, we were starting to think about these things, so that made me want to start working with animals. Um, and I actually, I had an interview at Goldsmiths to do a master's there. And I went to this interview and I said, first of all, the two people were horrible. It was one of the worst interviews I've ever had in my life. But the woman, I said to her, I want to do work about the environment and our effect. And she went, why would you want to do that? No one's going to be interested in that. What? And it made me, so, I, made me so mad. I was yeah. so angry. I mean, the two of them were awful. They were so rude to me. My work was rubbish. I'll say that now. I, I know why I didn't get in. But to <laughs> say that really made me so angry because I thought, you know, you, we, this is a really serious thing, and Goldsmiths is an institution that has a voice. And artists, I mean, one of our roles is to talk about problems and things. We need to make people aware. So to say something like that drove me to make work about the environment. So I ended up, I had a, I'd been offered a place in Dundee anyway, so I went there and I said, right, that's what I'm going to do. I want to make this work partly because of what somebody told me wouldn't work. And yeah, so that was the, the driver for it. And then as I said, because I lived in the countryside, I was picking up dead animals all the time and finding injured animals. I did films with them and um, the taxidermy actually, it started when I moved to London. Um, I used to enjoy the skinning process, but mm. I didn't like the mountain. Thing, yeah. Because the thing is, it just, <laughs> <laughs> the thing with taxidermy, I think traditional taxidermy, it, I didn't feel like I was putting my own mark on it because with traditional taxidermy, you're making something look alive in a pose. And to say that, there are lots of amazing taxidermists who have got their own stand. Jasmine Miles Long is an incredible taxidermist. But for me, I really struggled with that. So I didn't really mount the animals. I used to skin them and keep them in the freezer. And then when I moved to London, I then realized that I could use the taxidermy in my work. So that's when I started mounting them. But when I was mounting them, I wasn't trying to make them look like they were alive. You know, mm. they very much look like they're dead. You know, a lot of people find them quite disturbing. But, um, yeah, that's when I started working with animals. Um, and then in the last four years, my work is less about taxidermy. A lot of my older works, I should say, were about the past. So I was really interested in ethnographic studies. I used to go to the Horman, Horman Museum every week oh, to the library. Yeah. So I loved costumes, I loved jewelry, I love everyday items that different cultures over history and all over the world have made. Because so many of these items are connected to nature, they use natural materials. And I think in the modern world, I often feel so completely disconnected from that yeah. through consumerism and through the things that yeah. we use. Um, and uh, like the, the piece that you like, that was all about me. It, it was a piece 
So the photographs I make, I should say, they were always me in different costumes and I always had my face covered. And the costumes that I make were often made out of natural materials. So the one that you were talking about was a giant clump of sticks that I had covering my entire head. And that one I made because I just, I wanted to try and change the way that I live, but when I mapped it all out and looked at it, I didn't know how I was able to do that. Because we're, the way that we live is in such a way that it's like, well, how do I buy this or that without having this effect? How do I do this? And I felt so overwhelmed by it that I felt like I couldn't get out of this structure of the way that we live as human beings in the modern world. Like, it's very hard to live in an ethical kind of way and to do things when, you know, package all these different things. There's so many things that make it difficult. So, yeah, the work that I do now is more focused around the present day. Um, and my work is more about consumerism. I'm interested in the way that we use nature within consumerist items and products. So I've got a show at the moment at Solaris and Norman Road that's looking at primarily household paint colours. I'm fascinated with household paints and the way that we use animal names in them, the effects that the production of them have. In some cases, there's more consumerist items made of a certain animal than there are that animal. Mm. The Indian tiger, for example, there's 3,500 of them. There are millions of items that use that animal or use the figure of that animal or a form in some way. So I'm very interested in, in those kind of things and I use a lot of consumer items now. And also I like decomposition, so I've done a lot of works uh, working with blood uh, from uh, domesticated animals where I leave them in the forest and fabric and then I, I film all the different insects that live on them. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's amazing. It's like decomposition is so massively important to nature and we are completely disassociated from that as a species. We can't decompose naturally because there's too many of us because we have an issue with populations. There's way too many of us. So it's those kind of things are part of my work. Yeah, yeah. So how, how's the coast, having lived down here for so many years, how's the coast started to employ? It re so before lockdown, I went from my house to my studio to the supermarket to my house. I never went and saw anything. And I think after lockdown, I was like, right, I want to see everything. So I went to pet level. And I started working with clay, just like you. There's clay everywhere. If you live in Hastings or St. Leonard's, if you dig deep enough in your garden, you will find clay. Well, we live on a, a clay bed, a clay and bed. it extends under the channel and yeah. pops up again. And there's dogs. all sorts of different types mm. of clay everywhere. So I work with lots of different types of clay now. I love it. I mean, some of them are very difficult to work with. Some, if you fire them to certain, so I fire yeah. them all. If you fire them to certain temperatures, they will melt in your kiln and destroy mm. it. So I do a lot of work with sediment. So I go to Fairlight and there's these chunks of sediment that fall off the cliff all the time. And some of them are millions of years old. Mm. And that blows my mind to work with a material that is that old. It's, it's just fascinating. So mm. I'm doing a lot of work at the moment with sediment and I fire them because when I pick them up, they're these crumbly pieces that just fall apart. And I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with preservation in a way, in the way that human beings feel they need to preserve things. So I preserve a lot of things from nature, which would naturally decompose and I'm almost kind of reversing that. So I'm interested in why I feel the need to do that and why it's such a human thing to preserve. It's, it's quite an unusual thing, but the coast has now become really, really important to my work and collecting clay and collecting different materials. But I, I do go into that thing sometimes where I go, I went the other day to the beach and I ended up coming back with loads of driftwood. Mm. And so, oh God, they're all really nice, but then I've just got these pieces of driftwood everywhere and it's like, we're going to stick it to a mirror or are you something. Are you trying to see clay? Am I trying to, what, sorry? Are you trying to see clay as well, working with sea clay? Yes, yeah, so I work. That's, that's an interesting material. I mean, oh my God. I grew up, I grew up, I grew up digging love worms. Yeah. And that thick, black, mucky stuff. I it's, never, I never, for a moment, yeah, thought that you could make stuff from it. So I'm obsessed with the smell of it. And yeah. I'm trying to extract the smell because it smells like petrol. And obviously there's a connection between petrol and you know, how we do it. So I'm obsessed with the smell and I'm trying to work with people to try and extract the smell because it smells like plastic. It's the weirdest thing. But if you fire, it's the black clay that you get done at the sunken forest. If you fire it, it melts. It's, it, it can't deal with temperature. So what I've been doing is I've been using paper, which is modern trees that have been turned into paper, and then I mix that with the clay and it makes it structurally stable. So I really like that relationship between the clay that's got this million little pieces of forest in them and then using a modern piece of wood that's been turned into paper to make that material more structurally strong. So is that the salt content in that clay affects the fire as well? Yeah, so um, my kiln is ruined. So yeah, I'm going to be killed, I was going to say. Yeah, that, yeah. ruins my kiln. I, I, I got a kiln because I used to, so I run art studios and we used to have a very popular ceramic studio called Common Clay that are now in Bex Hill. So they were with us for four years. So I used to use their kiln, but it got to the point where I couldn't anymore. Because <laughs> I will put, if, if you tell me I can't do something, 
I will do it, yeah. and I will prove you wrong. <laughs> um, so I, I've stuck pig skulls in the kiln, I've stuck, oh god, so many awful things. So I've made so many mistakes, but that's part of the process of doing it. So my kiln is ruined, basically. Yeah. It's really ruined. Um, yeah. Then the salt content from the sediment is a massive problem, yeah. because it just... Yeah. But that's part of creating work, you know, is you have to make mistakes. Yeah, so it is, because, I, because I, you know, when you came to see me, it was very much about the ceramic pieces. That I you know, I was supposed to make ceramic pieces for you, and I forgot. I'm, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I know. I'm waiting. But you, you're still doing that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I'm still doing it. I think the ceramic, part of the ceramic started because I did it as a hobby. I wanted something to do that wasn't part of my practice. Because when you've got things part of your practice, it, it absorbs you. And I needed a creative outlet that I could just do at home that I wasn't thinking about. So that's why I started doing clay, and within two months I'd made it part of my work. So it's, I can't not include things, I find it very hard not to. But yeah, I make pots and things just for fun, and then I use ceramics in more of a sculptural way for other pieces. But mm -hmm. yeah. What, they're real wrong? Like, what, yeah, they're really wrong. Like, I, I use the clay, um, I don't process it in any way. So I use it straight out of the ground, and it gives an amazing marble texture, because there's different qualities. If you process the clay, you'll lose the variation what about, of colours. What about the, um, what they call the inclusions in the clay, like bits of shell, bits of stone? Yeah, I like to keep all of that in it. And it, it, it works, it, it fires. I mean, sometimes they'll blow up. so heavy and so big. It's, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they're quite thick and they quite Yeah, they pieces, tend to yeah. work. When I make pots, though, I pinch pots, so I make them as thin as physically possible, which right. is not a good idea with land clay because it struggles with, you know, if you don't process it, it's quite hard to build things from it. But I mean, Martin's mm. great at it. So I went to one mm. of his workshops. He was really yeah, inspirational in doing it. Yeah, quite I think we, and we, we did it with him. We did a workshop with him. Yeah. He made this amazing paper kiln and then I tried to do it. Yeah. And I did, we, it was so bad. It was this, it, it's a big kiln you make out of paper and clay and his was perfect. When we did it, we did it wrong and the whole thing went on fire. Mm -hmm. And we made it way too big and it was a massive disaster. So I need to go on a yeah. Well, my, mine's been, yeah, making, mine's been making those kilns for, for years. Yeah. It's where he started. Yeah, he used to make big sculptural sort of almost fire breathing kilns yeah they were, they were sort of animal structures but they were massive and he went to those smaller kilns uh literally a wheelbarrow in a lot yeah. of instances the because they were just so unwieldy you get you know you make a massive sculpture in a community fire it up and then you know having to dismantle it and remove it yeah. was a was a was a hassle but they so were sculptural objects then because i remember yeah yeah they were yeah at the end when they were burnt down they were these amazing sculptural yeah. objects they were because I think when we did yeah, it, yeah. we didn't have that massive a good success rate with things surviving. It's like, no, did you, what if things did, blew did, up? Did you hear the story about Martin? We're going to turn this in a thing about Martin, but did you hear the story about when he was digging the sea clay? Yeah. And he was making these pinch pots pretty much on site. He was pulling it up, let, letting it air dry for a bit, making a pinch pot. And while he was making that, he'd, he'd constructed a kiln on the beach. As you did. And uh, he had a photographer with him. And he's got this photograph of him with his trousers rolled up with the sea up to his ankles. And I said to him, sure, you know, surely you, you, you should have done it on the beach. He said, well, I, it was. The tide wasn't in when I started. <laughs> and by the time I finished my reconstruction, the, the kill got up to temperature. Yeah, it was about eight, ten, six to eight hours to get on such a temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a long time. Yeah, and the tide came in. He hadn't thought, thought, thought that one through. <laughs> so, let's move on. Yes. Let's move on. I understand that you uh, provide workshops or studio space. Yeah. Sort of affordable uh, studios in yeah. Hastings. So we've got two buildings. Um, I've got Common Mormon Studios, which is on Mount Pleasant Road, just down from the up from the park on the hill. And then we've got Hewn, uh, Blackman Studio, which is on Hewenden Road, which is right around the corner. So we just opened that one uh, a year ago, next a year next month. And then uh, Common Mormon we've had for six years. So yeah, so Coastal Currents, for me, my involvement is with the open studios, that's what we do. So every year we open for the first two weeks, we open on a Friday and Saturday. Um, and it's, it's really valuable to us because a lot of the artists that we have have just started out. And it's a great experience for them to actually talk about their work because mm. when you work in a studio, you're spending mm -hmm. all this time on your own, you don't really communicate with people. So having the public come in and to chat about your work and a lot of these artists haven't exhibited before, so it's a really good chance for them to get used to what it's like to be an artist. And 
to talk about your work and to show people what you do. Um, and I love it because I always find out new things about my work. People always talk to me and say, oh, what about this or this? And it's, it's nice to have that engagement with the community. Yes. Um, and especially on the Hewenden Road, um, it's more of a residential street. So we have lots of the local people coming in. And these are people that aren't necessarily interested in art. And mm. having the chance to talk to us and they talk to us about little projects they're thinking of and it, it, we can encourage them. And it, it, it's really nice. So the open studios are really, I think, important. And it's also from my perspective, running a business, it's great for people to know that we're there. Um, we've just started doing workshops, so we're opening a ceramic studio again at uh, Common Mormon. So we're going to be doing workshops there and we're going to be doing memberships. So again, having Coastal Currents is a great way to advertise that and it's a great way to, yeah, advertise my business, basically. So, yeah. work, so working with the community, that, that whole infrastructure of artists and stuff like that, obviously is yeah. a big feature of the work that you do. It's important. We try and, yeah, we try and provide affordable studios. I, I know from being an artist for quite a while now how hard it is setting up as an artist. It's, it's not easy. You need to provide affordable mm. spaces. They're not huge spaces. You know, they are smaller spaces for artists. The idea is you start with a small one. If it works out, you build up to a larger one. If it doesn't work out, you can leave. So we have a, a one to two month um, notice period. So I don't tie people in to long contracts six months a year. It's, mm. it's not fair and it's not feasible for a lot of artists. You need to know whether you can do it or not. So usually I can find a replacement within a week so people can leave. We don't have that, we don't charge that, we don't charge business rates. So we try and make it as easy as possible for us to have studios to see how it works. And if it doesn't work, they can leave. And if they want a larger one, they can go in a waiting list. And when another one comes up, they get first dibs on it. Mm. And yeah, so we try really hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a lot harder in the last, since COVID, when lots of people have now come in. It's good in the sense that we have artists wanting spaces that rents have gotten really stupid. It's really difficult to be able to run these kind of businesses. We don't charge electric or anything like that. That's part of it. You can't control that. So if you've got an artist that decides they're going to just bring in an electric radiator for a month and you don't know about it. Or a kiln. No, they're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the kiln. So things like that. It's, 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 it's been a lot harder to run the studios. One of them's not so bad because I own that building and that I was very fortunate to be able to do that. The other one I rent and that's very hard to do at the moment in this climate. It's just yeah. really difficult um, with the way that bills have gone and the way that rents yeah, have gone. Yeah, yeah. But we, we try, you know, and we're still going, so it's good. So obviously having coastal currents is really important for us just to let people know that we're there. Yeah. So, and like you were saying, workshops, we're starting to do more of them because it's a really good way of bringing in money to be able to afford to pay for them there. But like a small community, having a small community and just having that support is amazing. And that's one of the things I really love about here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the support that people just, I mean, at one time I went into a little cafe and they turned around and said, are you an artist? And I said, yeah, they went, do you want to show? And it's that simple, you know, it's, yeah, yeah so it's really great. If really you're any good, of course, not always that simple. Well, I don't know, I've seen something. I've struggled with that. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, there, I get that. Well, you've sort of answered the, 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 the question which I was leading to, is about yeah. the importance of working with the local community and, and, and working with the festival and stuff like that, and how yeah. important that is to you. It's really important, but I would say that I, I would love to see more people getting involved, especially with open studios. There are so many people that have studios in their homes or in their gardens, and it would be great to see more people opening up to the public because we have a map when we work with the open studio, so you go around. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of up here, so it would be great to have more people up here to <laughs> encourage, because the good thing now that we've got two studios around the corner is that more people are coming up. Prior to that, we find it quite difficult to get people to want to climb a hill just to come to one studio. So yeah. it'd be really good to try and get more people to open up their homes. I know some people don't really want to do that, but you know, open up your homes, open up your spaces to let people come in, you know. You say, work. you say getting people to climb up a hill, try and get them to go to Robert's Bridge. I know. <laughs> <laughs> mini bus. Yeah, maybe. Well, actually, a mini bus, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's a good idea, Tina. Mm. Future plans. So, we're opening up the ceramic studio, so that's going to be my main thing. Um, as I said, I've been lucky. I had a show in the college in the A space, then I had a show upstairs in the fifth floor gallery with the uni, and I've got a show at Solaris. So, I'm kind of showed out at the moment. I want a little. Although that's not, if anyone wants to offer me, sure, I'll take it, but... So, you know. so, 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 so how's, how's that panning out? So you've got... Well, the two of them have finished, and then one of them was supposed to be for two months at Solaris, but they're actually keeping oh. it on until the end of May, because oh, it's right. been really... Yeah, we've had a really good reception with that one. Really? Yeah, really, so it's yeah. been really, really good. Yeah. I'm very fortunate. Solaris have been massively supportive of me. If you don't know Solaris, they're they do... Road, aren't they? Yeah, fine art printing on Norman Road. They're yeah. really great. I get all my work printed there. Uh, so. And is that prints? Is predominantly prints? Yeah, so work? for that exhibition, um, when they invite artists to work there, it has to be print, because they print out the works. 
Oh, I see. Yeah. So it was all print, but that, I like working like that because it made me do wall pieces privacy. I don't know what sculpting installation. So I like having specifics because it makes me have to look to new ways of working. So, so, so what was your sort of favour? Sculpture? Photography, you know, I, sort of I, I like mixing and I, I mix and everything. I mean, at the moment, mm. since COVID, it's like fine. I love working with fine imagery and fine photography and fine objects. That's even with the sculptures, it's, mm. it's always fine things. I like obsessively collecting things. That's the way mm. I work. So I've, I've, I used to obsessively collect stuff, but I didn't know what to do with it. So now I've got to a point where I know I can incorporate it into my work. And it's because I have a theme, which is our relationship with nature and, you know, human beings and how we live with the natural world. So just having that kind of theme allows me to work with materials quite easily, I think. I think it's pretty easy when you know what your work's about. You mm, have a theme yeah, to kind of attach to yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. Good, good. Well, I think that's rather done. <laughs>